welcome to Break Forth Fully Alive. I'm Arlen Salty, your host and the co-founder of Break Forth Ministries. We can all use a little inspiration in our day, and that is why Break Forth Fully Alive is here for you. After over four decades of holding events throughout the world, we are pulling together some of the best of the best messages from these events. We are here to inspire your day. Okay, let's get started with our next guest. Our speaker today is John Ortberg. Let me tell you a little bit about John. John is one of the best-selling Christian authors of all time. He is an inspiring speaker and the senior pastor of Menlo Park Presbyterian Church in the San Francisco Bay Area. His many books include The Life You've Always Wanted and The Me I Want to Be. Here is John Ortberg. I'm thrilled to be in Edmonton in January, and I want to talk with you for a while about Jesus. I just want to talk about Jesus, nothing but Jesus. I live 30 minutes south of a city called San Francisco. Why is there a San Francisco? Because once there was a man named Francis of Assisi, who inspired so much generosity and love that people named cities after him. And he did this because of a man named Jesus. I live 30 minutes north of San Jose. Why is there a San Jose? Because once there was a man named Joseph whose life was changed by a man named Jesus. The capital of the state where I live, California, is called Sacramento. Why is there a Sacramento? Because a man named Jesus had a meal once to express this staggering idea that God loves human beings so much that he suffers. And this meal became a holy thing, a sacrament. You cannot look at a map without being reminded of this man who lived 2,000 years ago. The impact of his life is so deep that his birth remains the most widely celebrated in the history of the world, and nobody comes close at number two. The instrument on which his enemies killed him, a cross, marks more graves. Not just that, is part of more jewelry, is the single most recognizable symbol in the world. The movement that he started continues to grow even though we, his followers, so often fail to follow him in any way near the spirit in which he lived. If you ever feel inadequate as a witness to or servant of Jesus, I want you to be encouraged for a moment. This is from a guy named Eugene Peterson. He writes about growing up in a Christian home, but being picked as the victim of a second grade bully named Garrison Johns. This is what Eugene Peterson writes. I had been prepared for the wider world of neighborhood and school by memorizing, bless those who persecute you and turn the other cheek. I don't know how Garrison Johns knew that about me, but he picked me for his sport. Most afternoons after school, he would catch me and beat me up. He also found out I was a Christian and taunted me with Jesus sissy. I arrived home most afternoons bruised and humiliated. My mother told me this had always been the way of Christians in the world and I had better get used to it. I was also supposed to pray for him. One day, I was with seven or eight friends when Garrison caught up with us and started jabbing me. And that's when it happened. Something snapped. For a moment, the Bible verses disappeared from my consciousness, and I grabbed Garrison. To my surprise and his, I was stronger than he was. I wrestled him to the ground, sat on his chest, pinned his arms with my knees, and he was helpless. At my mercy, it was too good to be true. I hit him in the face with my fists. It felt good, and I hit him again. Blood spurted from his nose nose, a lovely crimson in the snow. Again, this is Eugene Peterson, the man who wrote the Message Bible, writing this. I said to Garrison, say uncle. 
He wouldn't say it. I hit him again. More blood. Then my Christian training reasserted itself. I said, say, I believe in Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And he said it. Garrison Johns was my first Christian convert. So if you have ever felt guilty about being a failure in witnessing, be encouraged because Jesus' influence endures, not just in spite of those who oppose him, but often in spite of those of us who try to follow him. Great historian put it like this, regardless of what anyone personally may think or believe about him, Jesus of Nazareth has been the dominant figure in the history of Western culture for almost 20 centuries. If it were possible with some sort of super magnet to pull up out of that history every scrap of metal bearing at least a trace of his name, how much would be left? We should help every human being do this, because everybody needs to, everybody in Canada needs to. Regardless of what they think about religion or claims of divinity, consider Jesus. Not Christianity, just consider Jesus simply as a person who was born and lived and died. Look honestly and without prejudice at his impact on our world, and anybody will have to ask, who was this man? Man. For the next few moments, what I want to do is not argue about Christianity. Too often we do that. I want to look at the world into which Jesus was born, which is darker than most people know, and the world that Jesus saw, his vision of the kingdom, which transformed the human imagination, and then the world that Jesus touched that we live in, because we live in a Jesus-shaped world, and when people come to see that, they admire and wonder at and love Jesus like never before. And that's what I hope will happen in these next moments, that we just marvel about Jesus. I want to start by naming the obvious. It would be hard to choose a less likely candidate to change the world. Jesus never did the things we think of world changers as doing. He never held an office. He never led an army. He never wrote a book. He never traveled abroad. His followers were remarkably unimportant. The New Testament itself records them being called unschooled, ordinary men. And yet 2,000 years later, it is simply impossible to imagine our world apart from the life of this one man. First, he gave the world its most influential movement. Imagine a world with no church, no Notre Dame, no St. Paul's, no storefront churches, no house churches in China, and then all the people. A world with no Peter or Paul or Timothy or Augustine or Aquinas, no Origen, no Francis of Assisi, no Mother Teresa, no Martin Luther, no Dietrich Bonhoeffer or Joan of Arc or John Milton or John Wesley or John Calvin or John Bunyan or John the Baptist. But let's go back to the beginning, back to the idea of a church. Do you know, in the ancient world, there were nations, there were families, there were ethnic groups, there were guilds, there were tribal religions, there were philosophical schools. The church was none of these. People said things about the church no one had ever said about any community before. Paul said, here there is no Greek or Jew, there is no circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and in all. He has erased every human division. In California, there is a theme park called Disneyland. Anybody here ever been to Disneyland? There's a ride at Disneyland called It's a Small World After All. Anybody familiar with that? That's a song that will drive you out of your mind if it ever gets into your head. On behalf of Americans everywhere, I apologize for it. It's a small world after all. It's a little vision of a world 
where people are not divided by gender or nationality or status. They're all together. Where'd that come from, that vision? Where before the church, where before the church was there a movement that actively sought to include every human being, regardless of ethnicity or status or wealth or gender, to be loved and transformed? Not only had there never been a community like this, there had never been the idea of a community like this. It was his idea. And by the way, if you are a part of a church, if you help lead or shepherd or nurture a church, you are doing a noble thing. If you ever get discouraged, if you ever feel beat up, if you ever wonder if it's worth it, it is worth it. There has never been a community like the church in the history of humankind. It was his idea. By the way, by the way, the 12 steps came out of something called the Oxford Group, a community that tried to reclaim the practices of Jesus for human transformation. No Jesus, no 12 steps. Now, I'm not saying that apart from Jesus, there never would have been an actionable vision of humankind as family. I'm just saying, as a matter of historical reality, it began with a poverty-stricken, crucified carpenter. Who was this man? Jesus changed how we think about history. In our day, we expect to see progress. We'll ask folks on surveys, do you think life will be better for the next generation than it was for the last one? Nobody in the ancient world was asking that question on a survey. Cultures in the ancient world believed that existence, human life, existed of just cycles. You go up, you go down. You go up, you go down. Events were dated by human rulers. So they'd be like year one of the reign of Augustus and so on. But over time, the power of every merely human ruler, the power of every Caesar in all their glory began to fade from the human mind. While another vision kept growing. By about the sixth century, a Scythian monk proposed a new calendar founded not on the myth of the birth of Rome, but on the birth of a baby named Jesus. You understand, the creation of that calendar, most people in our world do not know this, the creation of that calendar was not just a timekeeping convenience, it was a claim. It was a claim that life, yours and mine and everybody you know and love, is not a random cycle, but it has meaning. It had a beginning, and our world is leading somewhere, and the critical event in the history of the world was the birth of this Jewish carpenter. Now, Jesus lived and died, and no Caesar ever heard a hint of his existence. But Jesus was called, think about this, in the first century by his disciple John, the Lord of lords and the King of kings. That's not just a poetic, nice sounding phrase. That's a claim. Take all the kings, all the prime ministers, all the power brokers, put them in a group. Jesus is king over them all. He's not just a king. He's not just the greatest king. He is the king of all the kings. He is the Lord of all the lords. He is the CEO of all the CEOs. That's Jesus. Now, in the first century, when Jesus still had only a tiny little handful of followers, such a claim sounded laughable. And it may still today. If you were around then and you had to bet on whose influence would last longer, Jesus or the Roman Empire, you would not put your money on the carpenter and his motley crew. And yet today, 2,000 years later, we give our children names like Peter and Paul and Mary, and we give our dogs names like Caesar and Nero. Two thousand years after his birth, every time any human being anywhere on this planet looks at the date, we are reminded daily that this man, Jesus Christ and no other, has become the hinge of human history, that Nero died in the year of our Lord, 68, that Napoleon died in the year of our Lord, 1821, that Joseph Stalin died in the year of our Lord, 1953. Maybe 
Maybe Jesus was not Lord of lords and king of kings. But how strange is it that now every ruler who ever reigned, every nation that rises and falls must be dated in reference to the life of the carpenter Jesus. Who was this man? Jesus changed how we shape, how we express, how we live out compassion. Again, most people in our world, in our culture, do not know about this. People have no idea the impact of Jesus' life. Now, all human beings have a capacity for compassion, always have. But Jesus shaped this in ways we mostly don't know about. In the ancient world, in Greece or in Rome, it was generally the beautiful, the noble, the strong who were admired. And the wealthy might give money for public works, but it was a way to show a rich man's greatness. The weak and the marginal in the ancient world generally were not valued. First century Roman writer named Seneca wrote, we drown children at birth when they are weak and abnormal. And he wasn't embarrassed to write that. That wasn't hidden. That's the way human life was regarded. In the ancient world, a child could be left to die if it was the wrong gender. Anybody want to guess what the wrong gender was? Female. In fact, Rodney Stark writes about this. There were about 1.4 million boys in the ancient world for every 1 million girls. What happened to the other 400,000 girls? They were left to die. But the followers of Jesus remembered that he said, let the little children come to me. And they actually took in abandoned children. This is the man we follow. This is who he is and what he has done. This is why we marvel. Over time, they began the practice of godparents who would care for children after their biological parents died, which happened a lot. And then orphanages began because people began to leave children at, in monastic communities instead of on hillsides. These changes are so powerful that one book about them is simply titled, When Children Became People, The Birth of Childhood in Early Christianity. Widows who were actually fined by Rome for surviving past their husbands were taken in and cared for by the church which remembered Jesus telling his friend John to take care of his mom. In the first three centuries, there were two major epidemics that destroyed up to a third of whole cities. One ancient writer says it created such a panic in the general population, now imagine this, that at the first onset of disease, they pushed the sufferers away and fled from their dearest, throwing them onto roads before they were dead and treating unburied corpses as dirt, hoping to avert the spread and contagion of the fatal disease. But people in this strange little community called the church would bring in sick people whom they did not know, to whom they were not related, and care for them at the risk of their own lives. Because this Jesus that they followed loved lepers and the blind and the deaf and the lame, and they said, we must do the same. And this idea began to spread. In the fourth century, what was essentially the first hospital in the world was begun by a Jesus follower named St. Benedict. By the sixth century, monasteries would commonly have hospitals attached to them. Over time, over time, this idea that we ought to have compassion on all who are weak, on all who suffer, began to take root more broadly. At the Geneva Convention, an organization was begun to alleviate human suffering. It chose as its symbol a large cross on its flag known as the Red Cross. When you hear of groups like the Salvation Army or World Vision or the YMCA or Goodwill or Easter Seals or Habitat or Food for the Hungry, when you go to hospitals with names like Good Shepherd or Good Samaritan or St. Anthony's, you see the touch of Jesus, the autistic, the Down syndrome, the disabled the mentally ill, the broken. Do you understand? These were viewed by our ancient ancestors as burdens to be discarded. To see them instead as bearers of divine glory who can teach us and ennoble us. This is what Jesus saw. 
Now, this is not to say that there would be no compassion in the world without Christianity. And those of us who call ourselves Christians often fall way, way, way short. But one scholar puts it like this. If you ask what is Jesus' influence on medicine and compassion, I would suggest wherever you have an institution of self-giving for the lowly, schools, hospitals, hospices, orphanages for those who will never be able to repay, this probably has its roots in the movement of Jesus. And what if, just what if, there was a new birth of compassion and caring and love that became an epidemic by followers of Jesus right here in Canada? Canada. The Jesus movement shaped education. Now, human beings have always loved to learn. But in the ancient world, formal education was reserved for male children of wealthy families. But the church, remember, they followed a man who taught everybody and commanded them to teach all people. So they began to teach men and women and slaves and free. And this started an educational revolution. About the fourth century, some of Jesus' followers entered monastic communities. For many centuries, these were the only institutions in Europe for the preservation, not just of the Bible, but the great texts of the classical world. And then the church, the church began to build schools. And then universities, Paris around the 12th century. And then Oxford and Cambridge. By the way, the motto of Oxford University is, the Lord is my light. And then Harvard and Yale, 92% of all colleges and universities started in the U.S. before the Civil War were founded in Jesus' name. With the Reformation came the idea that every individual ought to be able to read the Bible, and that's what ignited the dream for world literacy. That's where it came from. Martin Luther said he would write a book about parents who neglect the education of their children. This is what Luther wrote. I shall really go after the shameful, despicable, damnable parents who are not parents at all, but despicable hogs and venomous beasts devouring their young. Luther had a hard time expressing his emotions sometimes. <laughs> in my country, in the U.S., the first law to require public funding for mass education is in the state of Massachusetts. It was called the Old Deluder Satan Act. Not a snappy title for a piece of legislation. Because they said education honors God because we can love him with our mind. And it's the evil one who wants people to be ignorant. In fact, Alfred North Whitehead, one of the great thinkers of the 20th century, was asked once, what made it possible for science to emerge when and where it did? And this is what he said. It was the medieval insistence on the rationality of God. Now, that's not to say that science could not have arisen otherwise, but the fact is, science as an organized, sustained enterprise arose only once in human history in Europe in the civilization then called Christendom. The great explosion of technology in the Middle Ages was in monastic communities. Mechanical clocks were invented because monks needed to know when to pray. We first hear about eyeglasses in a sermon because monks needed to pour over texts. Dom Perignon was actually the name of a Benedictine monk, no kidding, who contributed to the production of champagne because there were no Baptists to tell him it was a sin to drink it. <laughs> Jesus revolutionized education in our world. And some of you, God is calling to learn and study and hone your mind and be great be people who love God greatly with great minds for Jesus' sake. And you ought to do it because it changed the world. The alphabet of the Slavic peoples is called Cyrillic. They had no written alphabet. So a missionary, a Jesus follower named St. Cyril created one for them so they would be able to read the Bible. In nation after nation after nation, Christian missionaries who get so often so unfairly, pejoratively thought of found languages that had not been committed to writing and in acts of stupendous heroism they set about to that task in many cases the first effort at the scientific study of languages was from Jesus following missionaries they compiled the first dictionaries they wrote the first grammars they developed the first alphabets the first important proper name written in more languages than any other was the name Jesus the gospels are translated into more than 2,200 languages no other book is translated into one-fifth 
feared that many. Who was this man? The Jesus movement revolutionized art. Without Jesus, there's no Dante, whose divine comedy shaped modern Italian. There's no Luther, whose German Bible shaped modern German. There's no King James Bible, which helped to shape English. There's no Johannes Bach, who signed all of his works to the glory of God. No Hallelujah Chorus. No Mozart Requiem. No Gregorian Chants. By the way, modern music notation, you know those lines and so? That was an invention of the medieval church so that worship of Jesus would be able to spread. Imagine a world with no Sistine Chapel, no Da Vinci's Last Supper, no Pieta, no Justin Bieber Christmas album. (laughs) There simply has been no transcendent vision of reality. No cosmic story that has gripped the artistic imagination like the vision of Jesus. And by the way, if you have those kind of gifts, if you can sing or compose or paint or write or dance, seize it, love it, delight in it, revel in it, and use it for Jesus because the vision that Jesus brought has transformed art like nothing else. And art really does not have much to say about the human condition apart from his story. The Jesus movement changed political theory. Again, this is stuff most folks don't know about. Jesus said once, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. Give to God what belongs to God. Jesus said one time, my kingdom is not of this world. Now, it became one of the most influential statements in political history. Up until that time, it was assumed that the state had the franchise on religion. Because in the ancient world, in Rome or Greece or wherever, religion is part of what held the state, the people together. So whoever was in charge politically had all those levers at his disposal. There was in the ancient world no such phrase as state church because there was no other kind. But starting with Jesus, and then going to Augustine and Martin Luther and John Locke, there developed this notion of limited government, this idea that even kings will have to answer to a higher power, that the state should not run religion or vice versa. And as a matter of fact, the church generally follows Jesus worse when it has a lot of political power than when it doesn't. So if you ever feel marginalized, if you ever are tempted to be depressed or discouraged because it feels like those levers of legislative or political power are far from you, do not. Because the man who was killed by the powers that be changed it more than anybody who was. Who was this man? He changed how we think of human rights and human dignity. Primary founding document in the country that I come from has these words, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal and have been endowed by their creator with certain rights. Now, see, those are claims that all human beings are created equal. That was not self-evident in ancient Rome. That was not self-evident to Attila the Hun. Where'd that idea come from? You very often hear people in our day something like this. I believe in a God of love. Where'd that idea come from? Nobody in the ancient world, nobody said, I love Zeus, or I love Baal, or I love Molech. Nobody said that. It was Jesus who brought from little Israel to the rest of the world a new way of thinking about God and love, the value of a human life. When I was a kid, I used to play a game called Daddy's Home. It was my favorite game. I would be home, and late in the afternoon, I would hear the front door, and I would go running down the stairs and take a flying leap to jump into my father's arm. I did not bother to look. I knew that his briefcase would be set down, and that big frame would be stretched out wide to catch me. And I loved that game. That was my favorite game until one day my mom told me. My dad couldn't bring himself to do it. My mom told me that I'd have to stop. I asked why. And she said, well, it's not that your dad doesn't love you, because he does. 
It's not that he won't always be there for you, because he will. It's just that you're 37 years old. <laughs> Sooner or later, human arms get, you know, a little weak and so. <laughs> See, it was Jesus who said that God is like a father who is racked by tormented love for even his most wayward child. And this idea had real serious implications in human history. So Paul wrote, there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Thomas Cahill writes, this was the first expression of egalitarianism in human history. Now, often, supposedly, Christian individuals and nations violate this. But do you see, the power of Jesus' life and teaching has a subversive way of refusing to stay submerged. And that's why reform movements, like women's rights, when that was started 150 years ago or so in my country, or abolition, were overwhelmingly led initially by followers of Jesus. Jesus uniquely taught you ought to love your enemies. The idea to love your enemy or forgive is not a natural human idea. What was admired in the ancient world was helping your friends and harming your enemies. And again, that wasn't like something people were embarrassed about. There are monographs about ancient cultures that have precisely that title. Conan the Barbarian. Anybody here ever hear of a movie called Conan the Barbarian? I don't recommend it, but he was actually paraphrasing Genghis Khan when he gave his famous answer to the question, what is best in life? And his answer was to crush your enemies, see them driven before you, and hear the lamentations of their women. But once there was a man who said, what is best in life is turn the other cheek, go with them two miles, Love your enemy. Bless those who persecute you. Are you doing that? See, part of why they still live those words is they weren't just words for Jesus. When he died, he said about those who were executing them, him, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. And guys, I got to tell you, his followers remembered this. They were not casual about following him. We're told by one ancient writer, mockery of every sort was added to their deaths. They were torn by dogs and perished, or were nailed to crosses, or were doomed to the flames. Nero would take followers of Jesus, cover them with pitch, and use them as human torches to light gladiator games. And this went on for three centuries, on and off. And their response was not to dream of revenge or start an armed revolt, but to love. What are you going to do with people like that? The unique association of Jesus with love for enemies was so strong that historian Hannah Arndt, not a Christian herself, wrote, the discoverer of the role of forgiveness in the realm of human affairs was Jesus of Nazareth. Who was this man? He inspired a man named Tolstoy, uh, whose book Resurrection inspired a lawyer named Gandhi to begin a community movement of reconciliation. The last letter Tolstoy wrote to Gandhi was to praise uh, this self-sacrificing love of Christ. In the most famous speech in America of the 20th century, a man named Martin Luther King departed from his script to quote the prophet, one day justice is going to roll like waters, righteousness like a mighty stream. And the crowd couldn't keep quiet. They started yelling out, tell it, preach it, amen, amen. They were yelling like a church crowd. Not like a Canadian church crowd, apparently like, <laughs> like the kind that will answer you back. And, and, and King could not go back to his script. So Mahalia Jackson, the singer, piped uh, up like out of the choir, tell him about the dream. And he preached, I have a dream. I dream of a world that is not yet, 
but one day will be. I have a dream of a world where one day just is going to roll like waters, where little children will join hands together around the table, regardless of their race, Jew and Gentile, slave and free, male and female. It's a small world after all. I have a dream. It was not a secular dream. It was inspired by the one that Martin Luther King followed. See, the real question, see, the real question is not who was this man? The reason that we must be fascinated and compelled by this man is his work is not yet done. What might yet happen in the radical expression of compassion by you? What might yet happen in the waging of peace and justice and reconciliation, in the dignity of the marginalized, in the education of the left out by you, in the inspiration of artistic vision, in the call of the mighty to humility? What might happen if somehow the Jesus impact on Canada were to go greater in the next generation than in any before? for why could it not be so for still in our day the call of the carpenter comes to that man or that woman follow me see what I see love what I love follow me will you be that man or that woman the real question is not the real question is not who was this man the real question guys the real question is who is this man and I will tell you who he is He is the hinge of history. He is the hope of the oppressed. He is the inspiration of the despairing. He is the king of kings. He is the Lord of lords. He is the greatest teacher who ever taught. He is the greatest mind that ever thought. He offered the greatest gift ever given. He wants the greatest movement ever started. He alone mastered life. He alone conquered death. He alone overcame sin. He alone grows more present with every passing year. He is the son of God. He is the glory of mankind. The crucified carpenter of Nazareth is the hope of the nations and the savior of the world and that's who this man is thank you john for that incredibly powerful and inspiring message if you have been feeling insecure about your faith if you have been feeling insecure about the positive impact of the church and your messiah down throughout history please share this message with your friends and your family If you would like to learn more about John Ortberg, please go to johnortberg.com. We'd like to remind you that this podcast is sponsored by Breakforth Journeys, where we take you to the lands of the Bible, where we dig into the scriptures in places like Israel and Jordan and beyond. To learn more about our trips, please go to BreakforthJourneys.com. We are so grateful for you and for every one of our listeners around the world. We also want to remind you of an incredible treasure available to you for free. Yes, for free. If you'd like access to hundreds of hours of training from some of the top Christian authors, teachers, and thought leaders in the world, just head on over to BreakforthOnline.com. That's BreakforthOnline.com. When you're there, just sign up for a free membership to Breakforth Online, and you'll have access to hundreds of hours of free online training in everything from relationships to spiritual renewal to leadership and far more. And while you're there, don't forget to check out our upcoming live events, as well as our tours to the lands of the Bible for spiritual journeys of a lifetime. Thank you again for listening. Please subscribe, rate this podcast, and come back soon, where we will have more words of inspiration waiting for you on Break Forth Fully Alive.